for coming. Um, I think most people here, you know, most, most of the audience knows One Day Sooner quite well. And um, we, you know, were founded to support um, challenge trials for a COVID-19 vaccine. But really, uh, for, for most of us, I think, if not all of us, really the point is to accelerate vaccine, vaccine development for everyone, for people all over the world, really for all humanity. We think in these really large numbers of thousands of people lives can be saved, you know, if we think globally, maybe even millions of lives. And so part of this has been developing more and more of our vaccine equity efforts. Um, and one of the uh, one of the efforts is uh, my my co-moderator this afternoon, Zachariah Kabuko, is the manager of our manager of our Africa chapter, and he in particular is also engaged with some of these questions about medical research on the continent. Um, so he'll be um, you know he's a big part of the organization and will be a big part of this panel. Um, and then you know we've had these other roundtables that some of you have joined us for already. Um, some some people in the audience. We've talked about a lot of issues in the U.S., talking about ethics and inclusion in research, communication and hesitancy, trustworthy of, trustworthiness of the medical system, um, and now we and we've also um, done more and more of these issues of panels on global equity as well. So obviously, a lot of those same issues um, are at stake. Um, but we've also talked about other issues like um, access to vaccines in, in particularly in Africa and what that distribution um, might look like. We were talking about that in December, where a lot of this was even more unclear. Um, we have another panel coming up uh, next month that's going to focus on larger scale distribution. Um, so thinking about strategies for vaccine equity like uh, COVAX or um, adjustments to intellectual property. So that's something to look forward to next month. Um, this panel I'm, I'm excited about for a lot of reasons. We have really great panelists um, and I think it's a really, really great topic of, of talking about medical research especially because I think these panelists really going to um, get us at sort of a range of time scales of the history you know, of how we got to where we are in terms of the kind of research that is going on, what that did look like in Africa over the last year or so, what it maybe could have looked like and could have been better, and then even more so how it could look in the future um, to address you know, future pandemics um, that might hit Africa or hit the entire world, um, but also you know, a range of other medical issues, um, issues that medical research can, um, can benefit and can help us solve. Um, so, you know, we're talking about what does medical research look like, how has it served the continent now, how it has been developed, and how it could be developed in the future. So, of course, that has to do with vaccine distribution, but again, also a longer term future of what, um, you know, the global research landscape could look like. Uh, so, I already introduced my co-moderator. He'll be running the Q&A when we get there. If you have questions as we go along, you can send them either to Zachariah or to Danny Cerezo, who is our event coordinator. Um, you can also send them to me, but they'll definitely be able to see those and Zachariah will be running the questions. So a quick, uh, quick bios of the, of the panelists before I let each of them talk. They'll have five to 10 minutes to speak about their research, their expertise, um, and, you know, and how they see current circumstances and future ones as well. Um, and then we'll turn to Q&A. So definitely if you have questions, um, hold on to those and we will, we will get to those. There'll be plenty of time for that. So uh, Dr. Getnet Yumer uh, is the director of the Global One Health Initiative at The Ohio State University um, based in Eastern Africa. He has also served as the director for research and technology transfer at Addis Ababa University as a consultant for the World Health Organization. And he's been the principal investigator for a range of projects funded by the CDC and PEPFAR, USAID, Novartis, and GlaxoSmithKline. One thing you'll see across our panelists is a really wide range of institutions that they've worked for. Um, so I'm hoping that we can get into that at some point in the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Paul Ndebele is a senior research regulatory specialist and professorial lecturer in the Department of Global Health at George Washington University. He holds a PhD in research ethics from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And he joined George Washington University from Zimbabwe, where he completed five years of service as director at the Medical Research Council there. Uh, Dr. Melissa Kapulu is a postdoctoral researcher at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, um, with, uh, partnered with the Wellcome Trust Research Center in Kenya. She attended college in her home country at the University of Zambia and went on to earn a master's degree at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a doctorate at Oxford. Um, at Kemri, she continues to work on malaria vaccines and human infection studies, which she began at the Jenner Institute at Oxford. And lastly, Dr. Jennifer Mabuka Moroa is a clinical associate professor at the University of Washington 
and a consultant with the Alliance for Accelerating Science in Africa at the African Academy of Sciences. There, she focuses on, on improving the research and development landscape on the African continent. She holds a PhD from the University of Washington's Department of Global Health and previously worked as a postdoctoral fellow with the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard and also at the KwaZulu-Natal Research Center in Research Institute in South Africa. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ymir, um, and then we'll, we'll continue on from there. Thanks very much, Mabel. Do you see my screen? Yes. Thanks very much, colleagues, and uh, thanks, Juan de Suner, for inviting me to talk on such a very timely, important, and uh, exciting topic. I would like to set the tone on for the panel discussion by saying a few words on the global equity and medical research focusing in Africa. Before diving into the actual subject matter, let me let me zoom out a little bit and 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 um, uh, bring to your attention that be it in the MDG earlier on and now in the SDG inequalities have been recognized very well, both in the health sector and in the education sector and beyond. And the world has recognized that equity, so much as COVID has revealed and magnified it faster, uh, it has been out there in the world. And that inequality has been both within the country and among the different countries, considering a number of different factors. And unfortunately, coming to our continent, Africa, our rate to achieve and the progress uh, different countries are making towards the SDG uh, by 2030 is, is very much compromised. And countries really need to develop their effort, including ensuring inequalities are you know, mitigated. We have to work very hard and we have to develop our effort, including the SDG 10. Uh, obviously, there has been a number of declarations and call for action by different organizations, including the United Nations, different Congress, a very good example, call for action for a global health equity, the World Congress on Public Health, different declarations have, have passed. Unfortunately, most of them were not. So we need to work very hard and fast to ensure that we put all those uh, into a reality. Coming to the health aspect, WHO does recognize that in order for us to have a health, health, in order to achieve health equity, we have to work very hard in making sure that we know and identify drivers of inequalities. And some of these drivers, obviously, were recognized long ago when, you know, during HIV era, some countries were getting wonderful drugs, while some countries were trying very hard to get money to buy condoms. And that is even magnified during the COVID era, whereby, you know, what we are just seeing now in terms of the vaccine availability and the like, which is which has shown us a significant gap and then the really the need for uh, making sure that we, we really work hard to 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 make sure that we have equity. And in order to achieve that, one of the major pillar that we all should work hard is making sure that we have the data. We have the reliable, credible, and timely data. Unfortunately, again, Africa is deprived of that data as most low-income countries don't have a very well established, a very good example on imagine two thirds, greater than two thirds of them don't report there is, there is no system even to report the cause of death. And that kind of data is really critical for the world to recognize. Here, I want to pause and just give you one slide shot. Later on, we'll be discussed um, a collaborative work that we did with um, Resolve to Save Lives, which is a vital strategies initiative, our university, Ohio State University, and with the government of Ethiopia. As you all know, when COVID came in, the major pillar that we had, which somehow is balanced across, you know, in terms of equity works both in developed and developing countries is the non-pharmaceutical interventions. And we did serial uh, uh, survey 
involving 4,500 participants from pulling both qualitative and quantitative studies on the readiness and the cap on the implementation of non-pharmaceutical intervention. Just one slide to, to, give, to give you a heads up on what we may start the discussion is our study revealed that imagine two thirds of the population earns per family, this is per family, not per person, less than 150 USD per month. Again, another two thirds of our participants told us that they don't have separate room to isolate themselves if the family member gets sick. 30% were telling us that in order for them to wash their hand, there is no access to for running water. Half of our participants were telling us that after the pandemic came, they lost their job because of the pandemic. And obviously a little bit above the one third of our population claim that they will run out of food in three to seven days if we implement lockdown and shutdown uh, across the country. Coming to the medical research in Africa and just to show you how much injustice is uh, being served here, globally looking at the data in Africa, as we all know, conducting clinical trials is really pivotal, not only uh, to make sure that we collect a safe, I mean, we participate in, a safe, in assessing the safety and efficacy of drugs or vaccine or diagnostics, but also in making sure that the community and countries benefit from the post-trial benefits as well. Unfortunately, when we see the share of COVID, this is what I took from the clinicaltrials.gov. Until now, there has been more than 4,600 clinical trials done in the world. And if you see Africa, for example, just a head-on comparison of the US conducting 1,000 69 clinical trials, and the similar population in Africa is a combination of Ethiopia and Nigeria with 325 million people. Look at those countries conducting only nine clinical trials in COVID. So the, 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 the inequality starts from there. Unless you start, you work very hard in doing conducting research, the fruits of research want to be just as well. So I just want to put that that remark as we discuss. Obviously, we don't see any of, I mean, the African countries as the highest percentage, you know, COVID vaccine clinical trial running countries. We are not in the list at all. And one major root cause for this, the way I see it is, one major factor is most of the funding that we have been re receiving to conduct, be it a COVID or other research, it comes from international funding. So Africa needs to wake up. Yes, we have seen progress over time, but we really need to wake up and make sure that we invest a lot on our uh, R&D. The data is telling us that Africa is not doing well at all. Like it's only three states investing and on uh, R&D greater than 1% of their GDP on R&D, namely, you know, uh, Malawi is there, South Africa, Egypt is there, Ro uh, Uganda is also trying. So the rest of the continent with an average of 0.25 to 0.4%, we really need to push our governments, the politicians, policymakers, to make sure that we also be up to speed in terms of funding and implementing up to speed. Again, we should recognize that there is a major progress over time. This should, it's not like a luxury, it's a must as Africa is one of the highest population growth rate. And then we're expected to double up in 2050 as well. Let me end by, by uh, touching one, by having one slide since I sit in the Ethiopian National Ethics Review Committee, research equity all over should be I mean, out there. And one of the major pillars of research, as you all know, is justice, which is justice as countries, you know, when we do studies in countries and communities, we have to ensure that countries should neither be unfairly 
um, neither bear the unfair share of the direct burden, nor should they be unfairly excluded. And that's what we're seeing. Unfair exclusion, both from the design of the study, conducting the study, and having the fruits of the study. And in order to make sure that that's achieved, researchers, like most of us here, IRB members, different stakeholders need to play a major role. Back to you, Mabel. Thanks again, and would love to take questions. Thank you so much. And that last slide on ethics is a great uh, segue to Dr. Andabella, whose, special, whose specialty is ethics. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mabel. And uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, wherever uh, you are. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague uh, Gatnet for uh, laying the foundation for uh, what I'm going to talk about right now concerning uh, research ethics uh, uh, capacity. So I'm going to share on uh, my experience in terms of contributing towards research ethics capacity building across uh, the African uh, continent. Uh, as you heard uh, during my uh, introduction, um, I am uh, from uh, Zimbabwe and I've been working in various African uh, countries, including Malawi and uh, Botswana. I've also worked in Europe and currently I'm working here uh, in the uh, US. And uh, basically, um, uh, through these past 20 years, I've been working in this area of uh, research uh, ethics. And I'm currently serving as a senior research regulatory specialist at the George Washington uh, University. And in this position, I'm responsible for overseeing all the research which is conducted within the School of uh, uh, Public Health. And some of uh, this research has to do uh, with uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, my role is also to advise uh, both our faculty and also our students when it comes to regulatory and also ethical issues in conducting their own research. Additionally, here at uh, George Washington, I also serve as a member of uh, the GW Institutional Review Board. And uh, the IRB often relies on me when it comes to the review of uh, protocols that are going to be implemented uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, additionally, too, I am part of uh, the Department of uh, Global Health, uh, where I teach uh, three uh, courses or four courses that relate to research ethics. One is the responsible conduct of research. The other one is ethics in public health and uh, research ethics and uh, integrity. And the fourth one is ethical and cultural issues in global health and uh, programming. So through these courses, I'm hoping that I'm assisting uh, in terms of building capacity for researchers that are well grilled in terms of uh, uh, research uh, ethics and also uh, uh, integrity. Um, the fact also that I belong to the Department of uh, Global Health uh, means I play an important role in terms of advising my colleagues who are conducting research outside the US, uh, mainly those are uh, conducting research in African uh, countries. So I'm often uh, consulted uh, on issues and even in coming up with uh, uh, protocols. But over the past, let's say 15 years or so, I've been uh, working in various uh, bioethics capacity building uh, programs that are funded mainly by the NIH and also uh, by the EDCTP, which is the European Developing Countries Clinical Trial uh, uh, Partnerships. So right now I'm uh, uh, a principal investigator on a grant in the Democratic Republic of Congo that is aiming at uh, building the capacity of the Research Ethics Committee at the Kinshasa uh, School of Public uh, Health. So the idea is to ensure that we improve uh, the ethical standards uh, for all the research to be uh, conducted through uh, the University of uh, Kinshasa. I'm also right now serving as a PI uh, when a research ethics uh, capacity building program that we are implementing in Bamako, Mali, where we are trying to strengthen uh, the capacity of uh, uh, one of our partners there uh, to offer a master's uh, degree in public health with, with specialization in uh, research uh, ethics. So the idea here is that members of uh, the research ethics uh, committees within the region, West Africa, uh, and also even researchers uh, would have the opportunity 
to uh, participate in this particular uh, program. And in so doing, uh, we're actually building a capacity for Mali and also for the region when it comes to uh, research ethics. I'm also part of um, various other programs that are being implemented in other countries through other institutions. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Ethiopia through Johns Hopkins uh, University, uh, Botswana and also Zambia again through uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. So all these uh, programs that are aiming at uh, building uh, research uh, ethics uh, capacity in those uh, countries. But as I mentioned earlier on, I'm also involved in uh, uh, programs that are funded through EDCTP. And these programs are actually aimed at strengthening regulatory capacities uh, for uh, clinical uh, trials uh, in, uh, uh, in Africa. And right now uh, at uh, George, Washington, uh, George Washington University, uh, we are running uh, what we call uh, the COVID-19 and ethics uh, seminar series. And uh, to date, we have, uh, we have uh, 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 coordinated 20 webinars. We have been uh, holding these uh, once every two weeks. And uh, we have got uh, participants ranging from something like 40 to about uh, 300 uh, in any one of these. And we're looking at COVID-19 and looking at uh, its various impacts. Uh, COVID-19 impact on uh, women, impact on adolescents, uh, we've also been looking at uh, issues around the vaccination uh, programs. And uh, during the last webinar, we're focusing on uh, the vaccination program uh, domestically here within the US. And we're also focusing on Southern Africa and with uh, a colleague of ours from South Africa who was sharing with us about uh, their vaccination uh, uh, strategy. So in that particular way, we are trying to ensure that people are always uh, thinking about the ethical issues involved uh, even uh, as uh, countries implement uh, their vaccination um, uh, programs. Additionally, I've also been working with several other partners, including Pandora, the West African Bio uh, Bioethics Group, and also uh, Corent, uh, you know, facilitating uh, in some of their webinars that specifically have been addressing issues related uh, to COVID-19. And recently, I and uh, a colleague, we uh, authored uh, a paper which was actually looking at uh, payments for volunteers in COVID-19 Human Challenge Studies. So uh, this is a paper which is going to come out, I think, next week, uh, uh, in which we're actually saying, so far we've been thinking about uh, Human Challenge Studies being implemented in uh, rich countries, but we also need to ensure that there is capacity to conduct Human Challenge Studies in law and also in middle-income countries. So we're actually proposing uh, in this particular paper issues that should be considered to ensure that human challenge studies are conducted uh, ethically in law and uh, middle-income uh, countries. Uh, recently also, I and colleagues uh, wrote um, an interesting paper where we're looking at the role of commercial actors uh, in COVID-19. So we're looking at the role of commercial actors in the spread of COVID-19, right? So here we're looking at uh, players like the airlines, uh, the cruise lines. We're also looking at uh, the manufacturing of uh, PPE and looking at how the private sector has been uh, responding uh, to all these uh, areas. So we're looking also at the ways in which the private uh, sector players can play in terms of assisting in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, prevention uh, uh, programs. Uh, during the past um, two months, two or three months, I've been working with uh, colleagues at Africa CDC and also at the South African Medical Research uh, Council to develop a draft uh, framework for the fair, equitable and timely allocation of COVID-19 vaccines in Africa. So there was a meeting that was held, I think it was uh, in uh, December, uh, coordinated by Africa CDC looking uh, particularly at this topic to ensure that they provide guidance to all African countries to ensure that there is uh, equity when it comes to uh, the distribution of uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccines. And right now I'm working with our colleagues at the, the African Academy of Sciences uh, to look at uh, the research ethics landscape across about 17 uh, African countries that are participating uh, in one of uh, their programs that are uh, targeting uh, science uh, granting 
uh, councils. And in my previous uh, working life in Africa, I was also actively involved in the AVAREF, which is African Vaccines and Regulatory uh, Forum, coordinated through WHO uh, Afro uh, Office. So this was also an in initiative which was aimed at promoting um, uh, capacity strengthening for both the research ethics committees and also for the drug uh, regulators across uh, Africa. So in short, I would say these are some of uh, the activities that I have been uh, implementing and that I'm still implementing right now related to research ethics capacity across uh, Africa. So thank you very much. I hand back to Mado. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Kapulu, you are up next. I know she's been having some trouble with her internet. Is she on? All right, why don't we skip ahead to Dr. Moroa and we'll see if, uh, if Dr. Kapula hops back on. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be joining us from. As you've heard, my name is Jennifer Mabuka Maroa. I am a consultant with the African Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, I work across multiple different portfolios, but I'm going to try and limit uh, myself to those that are related to today's topic. So uh, for those who don't know about the African Academy of Sciences, really, I think that's where we need to start. And the, the, to be more specific, the platform Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa, because one of the reasons why that plus, platform was formed was for this very reason to bring some equity into medical research uh, in, in Africa, because uh, a lot of work is done uh, outside of the continent in terms of research. And when you come to the continent, you find that even some, most of the work that is done on the continent is not being spearheaded by the Africans themselves, but rather by um, our international partners who come in and then leave. Um, and so uh, AISA, as we refer to it, uh, was formed in 2015 to specifically um, uh, bridge this gap. And so the, the main goal is to really shift the center of gravity of African science to the African continent. And uh, what we are doing is, you know, really promoting uh, young uh, scientists, senior scientists by providing funding and uh, uh, working with them in strengthening their capacities, whether it's human capacity versus uh, infrastructure, so that we can have institutions that are capable to, of conducting uh, state-of-the-art kind of research that is comparable to an, any research that is happening anywhere in the world. So um, as I've mentioned, the AISA platform does two main things, which one of them being that it's, we set priorities for the continent, and these are aligned to the SDGs, as GetNet has shown us, and, and, but also the um, um, STISA 2024 and the Africa Agenda 2063, which it mainly kind of focuses on some of the science, technology, and innovation issues that, that the continent needs to be working on to, for us to, to meet the SDGs. So we align with those and set priorities. And then once we've set the priorities, we work with our global funders to make sure that we uh, have the funding necessary to um, design programs and uh, roll out programs that then answer the gaps or, or, or take these priorities forward so that we can fill the gaps. So I think that that's one of the key uh, areas of, of the um, African Academy of Sciences. And then the second one, which I've already alluded to, is the funding aspect. So over and above the prioritization that we do, we provide funding. And this funding sometimes, most of the times, is really coming from our international partners. And I think this is something we will discuss at the end. And GetNet alluded to it by saying that African countries, uh, most of the times, are not contributing enough to R&D and uh, that is a huge problem and that sometimes is what is drawing us behind and I think uh, we probably will give enough time to that uh, during the discussion. So uh, in relation to that very specifically, um, I want to mention that in connection to COVID-19 then, uh, in March, um, uh, after the lockdown started, uh, one of the things that the African Academy of Sciences that did with regard to um, COVID-19 was to uh, 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 conduct a webinar and a survey 
to really understand what are the priorities for the continent. We do recognize that by that time, WHO and GLOPIDA are put across what the uh, global uh, priorities are for, for COVID-19. But many a times this uh, uh, global, um, global uh, um, guidelines are not paying attention to some of the issues that we have on the ground in the African continent. And we brought together researchers and asked them the question, what are you seeing in your clinic or where are you seeing in your institution and what needs to be done? And a lot of work has been done around that. And there's a lots of publications for those who are interested, they can find the docu documents are available on the uh, African Academy of Sciences website. And then after that, because that was very informative actually, so the Academy worked together with our WHO Afro and um, uh, Africa CDC to put that together. Uh, we uh, realized how important that was. And then um, my colleagues who are, who are heading the COVID-19 response at the Academy uh, went ahead and again reached out to uh, other groups, the Global Health Network and UK, UK CDR. And they actually did a second survey which they did across uh, Africa and other low and middle income countries it was translated to multiple different languages so that we would cover all low and middle income countries to better understand what their real priorities are. And that work has also been published uh, and is available on the African um, Africa Academy of Sciences website for those who might be interested. But importantly, out of the prioritization of exercise that we did in March, we looked at some of the things that had been highlighted there and those informed a call that we put out. I think that call went out around July of last year. And that was a call specific to COVID-19 and uh, which uh, tried to address some of the priorities that the African researchers had put across. And, uh, you know, we had uh, applications come in and uh, by the end of December, we had finished going through the review process. And I, I, I want to believe that by now, the, the, the successful candidates have already been uh, 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 informed and the work needs, needs to begin. So that's one way in which we, you know, our, our work uh, from the ISA platform is relating to the COVID-19 work. Now, very specifically, um, with regard to the work that I do, um, I, I, I manage a program called Human Heredity and Health in Africa, which basically is a program that funds uh, African scientists in uh, doing uh, genomics and genetics work that, that is uh, around diseases of importance for the African continent. And uh, the program has been ongoing. This is about our year eight now. It's actually potentially coming to an end in 2022. Um, and so in that particular program, or as you can imagine, we've had uh, lots of um, capacity building around the area of, of uh, genomics and genetics, both in terms of infrastructure for biobanking and stuff like that, but also in sequencing um, uh, technology and also bioinformatics, which is the uh, um, uh, analysis of data from sequencing. And I want to say that uh, a lot of our grantees are currently taking lead in surveillance programs for COVID-19 because they have the technology, they have the know-how, they have the capacity within their labs to do this. In fact, the first sequence of uh, COVID-19 in, in, from Africa was sequenced from uh, uh, Professor Christian Happy's lab, who is also a member of the H3 Africa community. Uh, and his lab has been funded by both H3 Africa and the World Bank um, uh, Centers of Excellence uh, program. So, uh, really important that we have this uh, uh, capacity building within our local institutions, because then when uh, issues like the pandemic of COVID-19 come about, we are actually able to respond and, and we, you know, there's no need for us to wait for other people to come from outside to do it. And I think COVID-19 has taught us uh, a lesson that sometimes there can be lockdowns and and so we can depend on someone to fly from Boston to come and do the experiments or to tell us what to do in Africa. We need to have that local capacity ready to go. And so that's one, one thing that we are proud about, about the H3 Africa community because we've been able to really provide guidance and, and, and support governments in terms of surveillance. And then the other thing I want to talk about very specific to the work I do is um, I also, uh, manager program that has been building a platform of clinical trials 
uh, um, of our clinical trial community in Africa. Now, this is a program that GetNet again is very much a part of, it's been su very supportive. And um, on this pl pro platform, the idea to build it actually came about because of the inequalities of how clinical trials are conducted. We don't have as many clinical trials conducted in Africa. So we asked the key stakeholders what, what the problem is and what we can do to be able to fix that problem. And, and, you know, one of the things they told us is two key issues that they brought about were that uh, the regulatory and ethics um, in, environment was not conducive. Um, they don't quite understand uh, or rather have the intelligence information on where to go, what to do, what the timelines are, uh, what does it cost, you know, just basic logistical things that make it uh, very unpredictable for them. And if you can imagine, if you're talking about pharmaceutical companies, they want to, things to be predictable because it's all about time and money for them. And so that's one thing that they said. The other thing that uh, came up was the fact that, um, the fact that um, um, they don't uh, know exactly where to go to find a specific, um, you know, maybe PI for a specific scope disease area. So clinical trials on the continent, in other words, are not visible enough and clinical trial sites are also not visible enough. So they end up going to the same, uh, you know, uh, state of the art kind of um, uh, uh, clinical trial sites that are known by everyone else because somebody will come to me and ask me, oh, you know, where can I conduct this trial? And I'll say, go to Caprisa because everybody knows Caprisa. And then the little sites that are not very common then re uh, don't have work to do and, and end up being shut down. And, you know, that goes on and on and on. So we build this platform so that we can bring together the community of trialists on the continent bring together the clinical trial sites on the continent, bring together the regulators and ethicists on the continent onto one space. And also in addition to that, bring to, uh, to the platform, the sponsors themselves. In, that, in so doing, then they can have this space where we can have the conversations, we can interact, people can network, and hopefully by so doing, we can be able to increase engagements and collaborations and eventually increase the, um, investments in clinical trials in Africa. And again, get me, make my work easy. He showed a very good map on, of the COVID-19 clinical trials on the continent. And you can see how they, they, where the disparities are. And even, even with that, I just want to emphasize again, even within Africa itself, even prior to COVID-19, there's a study we had done and it had shown this exact same uh, distribution where even within uh, Africa, it, the clinical trials will always go to Egypt or South Africa. And that in itself is a problem, uh, given the fact that Africa is very diverse in terms of our genetic makeup, we do need to make them more diverse so that they're actually more, the, 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 the results are more relevant and can be generalized to the community of, of Africa. So we can't just conduct trials in, in, North, in, North, in, in Egypt and South Africa and say that those trials uh, can, uh, results can speak to the rest of the African uh, countries. And so by building this platform, hopefully we can be able to start these conversations and, and try to distribute these clinical trials across the continent so that we can be as diverse us in and inclusive as possible. And so I'll stop there for now and I'm sure uh, we'll have time to discuss a, a lot more uh, during the question and answer time. Thank you. Over to you, Mabu. Thank you so much. It looks like um, Dr. Kapulu's internet is not cooperating today. So uh, maybe she'll be able to hop on later. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, I'll turn it over to Zachariah and he can handle the question and answer. Um, if anybody has questions, please uh, feel free to either raise your hand and you can ask yourself or throw it in the chat or throw it to Danny or me or Zachariah. Okay, um, first of all, thanks a lot to, to Dr. Ime, uh, Dr. Ndevele, as well as uh, Dr. Maroa. Uh, wonderful presentation. So maybe to, to kick off the question and answer uh, session, You've all done extensive research in different parts of the world, not just in Africa. So in terms of comparison, do you, would you say it is more difficult to conduct research in Africa as compared to the Western countries or is it vice versa? Anyone can, can take it up. <laughs> okay, I'll take it, I'll go first maybe. So it depends on what it depends on what you're talking about in terms of um, there are 
multiple different things that you need when you're conducting a trial or rather uh, conducting research. And um, sometimes depending on disease focus, for example, you might find that if I'm studying malaria, I'm, I want to be in Africa, you know, but if I'm, you're studying something different, then maybe you don't, you don't need to be in Africa. But overall, um, there are institutions on the African continent that have the right infrastructure that they've built over time and can be able to do excellent research just like any other institution around the world. However, those are far and in between and they are most of the times in specific countries. And so our goal at the African Academy of Sciences is to make sure that that's not the case five, 10 years from now. What I'm saying is that we, we don't want to have a situation where all clinical trials or all research is being done in one country. And, and maybe that's South Africa or Ghana or Senegal or Kenya. Uh, what is happening? We want to see this work going to Chad and to Mali and to uh, other countries that we rarely hear uh, of, because as I said, the more research we can do across the continent, across the different um, uh, uh, po populations and communities, the better uh, the results are going, are, going, are going to inform us so that we know that we, are, we actually have, the, that the data can be generalized and can be used effectively if we are thinking about producing products like drugs or vaccines and, 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 and others from the knowledge that we are creating. So I'll stop there and let the others also comment. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. I mean, uh, great point. And yeah, maybe you leave it for Paul as well. And uh, that, that's a very wonderful question. And I, I want to start by, by saying that, as we know, Africa is, is a continent, not, not a country as such. And which in a way I have worked in eight different African countries in Africa as a clinical trial monitor, auditor, investigator, PI from phase one to phase four clinical trials. And I have noticed that there is a huge difference across different African countries. Having that in mind, I want to say that I had the opportunity to be part of, I mean, working in the industry, Basel in Novartis. I also had the opportunity to work in uh, first in human studies, Sweden, Karluska. And I have observed that there are obviously things that Africa should learn and will learn from uh, the experience that we had in the, in, in the West. But what, what I want to underline here is, as, as we always say, Africa shouldn't be uh, a ground whereby investigators from the West come, collect data and go back. We always want to make sure that Africa, from the designing of the study up to uh, benefiting, post-trial benefits and beyond, has to be part of all aspects of, of the study. So le let me stop there. It's not easy. Some of the things in Africa are not predictable. It's easy, but some like in order to get ethical approval, which Paul will mention, you may have a clear uh, like timeline in the West. You don't have that in Africa. I mean, pretty much glad that uh, Paul earlier mentioned about Avarif, which is a wonderful platform. I'm, I'm part of the reviewer now there. And that brought up wonderful opportunities for African countries to come together as a consortium to apply, get organized, contact. Very, very happy to be on, on I mean, with, with Jen here and the great work that Africa Academy of Science is, is doing to bridge all that gap. So, Paul, back to you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, uh, Janet. So just to, uh, to add on to uh, what you've said, in trying to respond uh, to Zakaria's question, uh, the answer would be, it depends on which country you are you actually thinking about. So this is why uh, right now, uh, even with uh, these capacity building programs, we are actually looking at uh, all the countries across Africa to ensure that at least in each and every country uh, we've got people that have uh, been trained so that that way uh, the research ethics uh, you know uh, infrastructure uh, improves uh, to some level uh, we also need to ensure that even our drug regulatory uh, authorities uh, have moved to that other level where you know that if when you are dealing with them things are so smooth 
uh, all the officers that you are dealing with, they know what, uh, what to expect and they also know how to process the dossiers uh, that they are going to be uh, handling. Uh, so this is also why uh, in Africa right now, uh, at the AU level, we are focusing on harmonization of uh, you know uh, the drug regulatory environment to ensure that uh, across Africa we've got similar uh, standards. Otherwise, right now uh, we've got higher standards in some countries and very very low uh, you know standards uh, in some uh, countries. Thank you so much um, for for those responses. So I think I, what I'm doing now is I'll take some questions before I come in later. So we have um, Professor uh, T. You, yes, Professor T. Ruza, please go ahead. I cannot pronounce my name, okay. <laughs> yes, um, good, good, good evening. It's evening time in Zimbabwe. Um, it was a very interesting discussion. I've got a question which will cut across the three panel panelists. Uh, the other one, I think it's a perennial problem which we have in Africa, especially being in Zimbabwe, you know? One is to poor. Uh, how, do you, how do you select which countries you need to link with? As you, because I've noticed that you are doing mostly empowering those who are in West Africa and a little bit in East Africa. And then the second one is to Jennifer. Um, I noticed that you were talking about resources. In Africa, we, do, we have resources, but the resources are not well distributed. Hence, we end up having countries like Egypt, or we can have Morocco, or we can have South Africa uh, being uh, preferred destinations by researchers because things are organized there, because they are basic require, required resources. Uh, yet the uh, the African Uni Union and the CDC, I don't know how much they are putting into uh, coming to uh, to a place where researchers from developed countries, they can come even if when they've got a trial. You would prefer that I want to go to Zimbabwe because the foundation is already laid. Which again takes me to the, my last brief question to uh, uh, Dr. Yima. Uh, you spoke so much about a few countries that he put their GDP more than 1% to health issues. And you see, we established Africa CDC Center. But there is a lot of insincerity from African government. How can we bring them? I don't, I'm not saying you have got to drive the issue, but maybe from your experience, there could be a way in which we have got to approach and improve uh, that we put resources. Well, the resources are definitely there. Every five years we've got elections. Every five years we've got, you know, changing like uh, our wardrobes, if I can place it that way. But we fail to improve our health uh, delivery. I will stop there. Sorry for being like a politician, but it's a complex issue where in Africa we let it sincerity. But then we've got this established like Africa CDC, which links with the, the governing body in Africa that can they assist in seeing that the basic reaches to, to, um, to these institutions so that they are well resourced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we can go on to the responses. Can I come on? Yeah, so uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Mdurusa, for your, your question. Particularly, I will try and address uh, the question about the selection of uh, countries. Um, for me, I've, I've been dealing with the NIH and also uh, EDCTP over the years. And what I know for sure is that even those funders, they are trying their best to ensure that we cover the whole of uh, Africa. So before any call, they would actually emphasize that right now, we want to give attention to these particular regions and countries uh, that have not uh, been given attention uh, during the past years. So even for me, as I'm looking at, um, you know, trying to come up with some partners across Africa, I also even look at uh, the whole of Africa and say, uh, you know, where can I go to? Uh, which area is underserved right now? 
So like in our case, um, recently we're actually looking at uh, Mali, right? So they, there wasn't a program in Mali, but we identified Mali. So it was easy for us to convince uh, the funders that it was worth it, uh, you know, uh, funding that particular program uh, in Mali. So the funders are actually looking into those uh, areas uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, the whole of Africa is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is covered. Thank you. So maybe I can pick it from there because he has given a very good response on behalf of the funders and I'm a funder really. Um, <laughs> and, and um, you know, when we put out our calls, for example, you can see on the African map, the countries that are consistently make applications and there are countries that are always absent. So that's one problem. And one of the reasons why that is probably happening is the poor capacity, whether they don't have the human uh, personnel in expertise in the areas to put in uh, the applications, or they probably don't have the resources, the infrastructure themselves to actually conduct whatever uh, research that they might want to conduct in, in response to that call. So that's a problem in itself. But as the, as the academy, we are very aware of it and are having internal conversations on how we reach those, those countries. One of, the one of the ways in which we try to do that is by um, making our more recent bigger calls more of collaborative. What that means is that you are not applying as one group from South Africa or Ghana, but you need to have another partner and this other partner needs to be from one of these countries that we want to build. So we look at uh, the application and, and, and determine, oh, okay, the, the main uh, principal investigator is coming from Ghana, but they have a sub, a sub um, or a copy eye in, in Mali or in, in Chad or in any, any of these other countries, Gabon, Togo, these countries that we don't hear about a lot, that in itself is, is, is a plus for that particular application compared to an application where, uh, you know, the PI is coming from South Africa and the co-PI is coming from Kenya and the other co-PI is coming from Ghana, because all those are countries that have reasonable resources already. So that's in response to that. The second quick feedback I wanted to give is that, again, on behalf of the funders, we are very aware of this uh, poor uh, you know, distribution across the continent. Actually, I sit in a committee for a WHO Essence that we've just been looking at this very question on uh, investment in capacity strengthening on the African continent and how to go about it. So, uh, because if we are not coordinated also, it becomes a problem. So if we can be coordinated as funders and know where the gaps are, then we can channel the investments to the needy, the gaps that are needed on the continent. And so we are working on that. Actually, there's a document out. And if your people are interested, I can share it with Mabel after this and, and she can distribute it to whoever that might be interested to look at that. And then finally, with regard to the political will, that has been, I think, the greatest challenge on the continent. And for me, um, from where I sit, I'm hoping that COVID-19 will be a lesson to the African continent. Why? Because at some point there was a lockdown and, and Paul would not come from Zimbabwe or whatever to help me in Kenya. Neither would Getnan come from Ethiopia to help me in, in Kenya. We need to build local capacity. Really, at this point, if COVID doesn't teach us as a continent about this, maybe nothing will because we need to learn that local capacity will be the first response to whatever epidemic or pandemic that we have. And we saw that um, in, in COVID-19, how quickly West Africa was able to respond because of the experience and the capacity they had built post Ebola uh, outbreak. So uh, at the African Academy of Sciences, we work closely with the African Union, we work closely with Africa CDC and uh, WHO Afro, and we're really trying to have these conversations through um, the Director of Strategy and Partnerships of the African Academy of Sciences to have these conversations with heads of state and, and make sure that the, the promise they made of contributing the, of at least 1% GDP is fulfilled in coming years. Because again, until we do that, um, it's going to be difficult. And just emphasizing that that's why, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as, as we've noticed, that's why South Africa and Egypt are way ahead. It's because they, they have invested in R&D. And so we, they are a good lesson for us to learn from. Um, just one quick example before I, I let uh, someone else speak. 
Right now, we are trying to understand the circulating variants on the African continent. And when we had our meeting with the South African group, it was just amazing how coordinated they are. The epidemiology people are talking to the immunologists, the immunologists are talking to the surveillance group. So you can, you can be able to say that this variant is increasing uh, um, incidence and the clinics are full and the immunology, this is the response in terms of B and T cell response. But then I have been trying to look at any other country in Africa that has that coordination and I haven't been successful. So we have a long way to go, but I hope that COVID-19 will teach us and we'll hold each other hands as we, as we know we are all in this together. So if we can, we can pull the countries that are lagging behind or institutions that are lagging behind, that's the only way we are gonna make it, over. Yeah, let me say a few words. Thanks, Dr. Mluza. And, and as usual, Jem, you, you really answered it wonderfully, even the points that uh, Dr. Mluza was asking me to, to reply. So very happy. I, I, I don't want to you know, spoil all the wonderful things that you, you just mentioned. Obviously, a year ago, Africa was talking about active case search, you know, surveillance. Now Africa is talking about genomic surveillance, not, not a simple surveillance. And, and we have to make sure that we really hammer on the silver lining that COVID has given us. Ethiopia, I tell you, when COVID came in last March, we were sending samples to South Africa. Now Ethiopia has 74 labs, standalone labs performing tests for COVID-19 and, and, you know, so that silver lining is something that, uh, that we always should count on when it comes to, to, to COVID. But uh, trying to, to wrap up on the point of GDP and Africa's contribution is up to us. I would say that us as an investigator, as funders, as researchers, as IRB members, we need to push our policymakers. We need to make sure that funders, everyone is aware. I mean, Obviously, something that I, I really want to emphasize is if we see Africa 10 years ago and now, there is a major, major difference and a significant leap in terms of even contribution in terms of the GDP. But are we there? The answer is obviously no. And we have been passing different declarations and, and in our statements, and we have to move from declaration to practice, and it's up to us to push the politicians, governments, and work together so that Africa contributes as it should. Yeah, let me stop there. Dakaria, back to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Dr. Um, Taimé. Uh, so um, the, next, the next area of discussion, I think uh, maybe on everyone's mind, when it comes to research everywhere in the world, the issue of ethics is a big one. Um, I think ethics review boards are are solely responsible for the approval or the, the rejection of many, many, many uh, scientific uh, research applications. So we'll get into this uh, into this one a little bit uh, into detail. But first, um, AB has a question on ethics. Maybe are you there? He just said he just needs one minute. <laughs> yep, sorry about that. I had to get my earphones to work. Appreciate it, Zachariah. Right, um, right. my, my question was about what specific ethical considerations go into hosting human challenge studies in the African continent specifically, uh, perhaps as uh, compared to the UK where I know they're uh, planning um, potentially the first COVID human challenge study. Uh, Dr. Ndivele, would you take that? Yes, uh, let me uh, try and respond to that uh, uh, question. So I think one of uh, the uh, most important issues that we need to be thinking about is the capacity in terms of uh, being able to conduct those human challenge studies. Because for human challenge studies, we want to ensure that we have got higher standards in terms of uh, the safety of those people who will be uh, participating. So for a lot of uh, the human challenge studies, you actually need to ensure that you have got the space, uh, you have got uh, the human resources to monitor uh, you know, the persons. You might need to detain them uh, in your facility maybe for a week or so. So you actually need to ensure that you have uh, the resources. 
So that's the, the, the first thing that I think is very, very important, the capacity to conduct such uh, trials. The second thing is also to ensure that we have the capacities on the side of uh, the research ethics uh, committees themselves and also even uh, the drug regulatory uh, authorities to ensure that they can provide adequate oversight over those uh, those uh, studies. So I know that right now uh, there is so much talk uh, in Africa about ensuring that we also have uh, the capacity even for phase one uh, clinical trials, right? So once you start talking about the, those higher levels in terms of uh, development of uh, capacity, then it means we are we are we are, we are getting we are getting uh, there. Then of course there are the issues around the payments. I mentioned earlier on the, uh, the 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 paper that we wrote that is going to come out next week. We were looking at issues around uh, payments, and in our paper we are emphasizing that for anyone who is going to participate in a human challenge stud uh, studies, we want to ensure that they clearly understand what they are getting themselves into. So this is not just about the money that they are going to be paid, but they need to clearly understand what they are getting themselves into when they are signing up for human challenge uh, studies. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Ndebele. I think uh, it's also important to, I think, address the fact that at some point there is an effect that um, uh, ethical review boards or ethics in general as a practice play in terms of promotion of um, research. For example, in, in Africa, I think there's a huge uh, part which has either um, forced people not to do research, uh, unfortunately, and uh, maybe has disadvantaged or discouraged that's even to think about conducting trials in, um, in, in Africa, for example. Oh, maybe we'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, we have Dr. Matare, uh, you have a question? Joseph Matare. Okay. Hi, Zakaria, thanks, thanks for allowing me. And good, good afternoon or good evening colleagues. Um, uh, thank you very much for for, for this uh, very useful conversation. I can tell you that um, what everyone has said right now is uh, something that worries me quite a lot as an African. Uh, we have never been out of Africa. Um, I finished my medical degree in Zimbabwe in 1997, and then went to Botswana, and then I started my MPH in at Medunza. Then, um, when I completed in 2008, in fact during that time. Um, I had this zeal as a young African that definitely, like what everyone said, Africa is fertile for research, which means every other problem that we had in Africa is researchable. And obviously, to deal with these issues, research would actually guide what needs to happen. But obviously, uh, as, a, as, as, as an aspiring young scientist and public health practitioner, I realized things were different on the ground. Um, other than hoping that maybe my career path would lead to public health, doing research, and also having to look after myself and my family and also contribute to my society. At least that was not possible. I think for exactly the same reasons that you've mentioned that political will is not there. And I thought probably without even talking about ethics of research in Africa or anything, the issue is that we need to get serious activism going. And obviously like what uh, Paul mentioned, engaging the AU at that level. And how else should we do that? Is even getting one of uh, the presidents around Africa, uh, someone who is approachable, and then someone who's forceful, we, we, we convince this one president to take that as his agenda to one of these uh, African Union meetings. And we say, this is what needs to happen in Africa, like uh, Jennifer mentioned, that COVID should have told us that we shouldn't be importing everything. We shouldn't be importing vaccines when we don't even know what's going to happen to these vaccines in our own in our own environment. So my own contribution right now is that I almost, in fact, I gave up on my public health training being something that I could, um, uh, uh, you know, apply in real life and make a difference in my society because there's practically just no research. Let's take, for example, in this COVID time. Um, I was in theater recently with uh, a few days ago with one specialist in our asking him. Uh, we could be seeing post-COVID syndrome right now in our own setting. Are you writing any papers? He said, I don't write any papers. This is one person where if he had written one case of post-COVID syndrome in our society, we could have known 
what it means. And then if you cannot write a clinical paper on an, on an article on a, on, a, on a clinical case, now can you even expect him to write uh, a research paper on a number of cases in Namibia? He will not, you know, do that. So my, my wish is that with the, uh, the clout that Paul, Jennifer, and everyone has, uh, why don't we make a plan? We, we find one good president in Africa who is progressive. Let's take, for instance, I don't want to mention anyone. Uh, well, let's take, for instance, Paul Kagame, and you say, Prime Minister President, this is what we think we should be doing in Africa. Now you take this course to the, the African Union and say, Without us Africans doing our own research, none of our health problems that we currently have will be solved. That is my contribution. Thank you, colleagues. And thank you so much, um, uh, Joseph Matare. I know that wasn't exactly a question, but uh, Dr. Marowa, you have a, a comment on that. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Matare. I just wanted to comment and um, I agree with you that we need to be working on this exactly as you have um, mentioned. But I also just wanted to let you know that the African Academy of Sciences is doing the best it can in that uh, form. So we have an initiative called CURRI, which is Coalition for African uh, Research Initiative. And its goal is exactly what you have said. Currently, Minister Elioda, I think is, is his name from Uganda, is the chair. And, and that is, um, he's taking this conversation to the African Union heads of states converse, to have this conversation around us investing in um, R&D for the betterment of the continent. Um, I must say that, you know, they are politicians. It's, they are, it's, it's, gonna, it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but at least the conversations are happening. But the more we push them, as you're saying, the more we all are, uh, you know, who are on the ground that are, I had, a, I had a totally different vision for our communities, as you're saying, that's me growing up thinking, oh, I'm gonna solve all the problems in my community. And then you soon realize that there are so many hurdles that um, you have to cross to get there. But if we all with, uh, had to put our, our, our efforts together, I think over time, maybe we will get there. But happy, happy to share with you more information on Curry um, also. Okay, thank you so much um, uh, for that comment. So uh, there's also another question from um, Setlo Omo. I know part of it was somewhat uh, touched on, but would you like to go ahead and ask a question? I don't, I don't quite see, I don't quite see you in the room, but uh, I think generally the- I think, they, I think they may have dropped off the uh, meeting. Yeah, you know, I think uh, part of the question was already addressed because I think this is uh, an idea that is revolving around taking a more organized approach to conducting uh, research, or at least uh, trying to motivate that countries do participate in research, uh, like taking it through the through the African Union. And I think uh, we've already had comments. Uh, coming from that. Um, George Rocco, you had your, your hand up. Do you still have a question? Uh, George, are you there? Okay, I, I, uh, maybe George will be coming back to us um, later. But uh, I also have um, other other things. Maybe we can we, we can basically talk about uh, from from what all of you have have shared in your discussions and from your experiences. Uh, I'm also curious to what extent do you think the current the current crop of scientists on the continent is laying the groundwork for upcoming scientists. I think taking the the comment from uh, what uh, Dr. Matere has I just mentioned. And also what uh, Dr. Maroa just mentioned, growing up you had aspirations and somehow those aspirations were met with uh, a harsh reality. So as uh, the current reigning crop of uh, African scientists, what are you putting in place for future generations of scientists to come? Yeah, can I come in? Yes, please, yes, please. So during, uh, <clears throat> during the five years that I was working in uh, Zimbabwe, I saw some um, 
senior scientists that have been playing some very, very important roles in terms of mentoring juniors. And right now, those uh, juniors are now scientists in their own right, because now they are writing their own uh, applications. So certainly we've got lots of very, very good uh, uh, you know, examples of mentors uh, across Africa who are playing uh, this very, very important role of building a capacity for future trials. One other uh, element that I can also talk about is the fact that in lots of uh, these big trials, uh, the PIs also make sure that they include some capacity building components in terms of facilities, right, uh, equipment, and also even training. So in that way, we are also building capacity for the future. So I would say we need to emphasize uh, the message that we need to continuously build our uh, capacity uh, as we move uh, into uh, the future. Thank you so much. Uh, any other comments on that? I would, I would like to hear what your thoughts are, Dr. Ime. And, uh, obviously, I mean, uh, Paul has, has touched it. That's the, we need to recognize and invest on, on the young. And one way of doing it is investing on mentorship. Mentorship in everything. What hear me? Hear me? Sorry, sorry, Zakaria. Yes, yes, yes. Are you hearing me? Okay. So generally, if Africa has to grow, grow fast and reach where it is, you want, you have to invest yeah. on the young and. Mentorship, as Paul mentioned, is the key for everything. I'm happy to share the experience that we have had. Do you hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead. Hello, do you hear me? Sorry for the glitch. Okay, so I'm happy to share our experience here. We're building a center of excellence. And we're building 13 PhD students on clinical trials. Funded by the world, the World Bank, we have a wonderful platform called Center of Excel CDT Africa, hosted at Addis Ababa University. That kind of initiative, funded by either World Bank or the African Union, we need to make sure that we invest a lot on that initiative, the ACE initiative, and and the like. But mentorship is the key, and today's mentees are tomorrow's mentors and colleagues and and collaborators. We as researchers, senior research, we need to believe that. We need to coach individuals who are coming up. So, thank you so much uh, for, for for that comment. The the other thing also uh, that I had uh, hinted on earlier on, I think uh, when it comes to to conducting uh, clinical trials or clinical research in Africa, there is a lot of nerve uh, on the part of uh, researchers, especially if they are coming from uh, Western countries. Now, I understand that there are obviously some colonial undertones associated to uh, Western researchers coming to conduct um, research on the continent. I don't know from, from you as panelists, how do you see as a way of getting around this? Because first of all, we do need research on the continent to, to go ahead. And secondly, there is definitely going to be some level of partnerships and collaboration with other Western universities, which is inevitable. But at the same time, uh, our partners from across the oceans, they are very, very you know, sensitive about, uh, about conducting, especially trials that involve humans. And so I don't know how you see as a way of getting around uh, this situation. I don't know if, if you want me to jump in there quickly as well. Go ahead, go ahead, I, I, I was chairing an IRB today, and that was one of the, the largest IRB conducting clinical trial. And one of the major issues that we always raise in, in this meeting, while, I mean, Paul will, will for sure come up with how much we should do strengthening IRBs all over, we have to make sure that our role is not, while protecting the safety of participants, we have to make sure that we also promote science. And for that, we need to have clear guideline and SOP to follow there are obviously, I mean, there is a need to build. Africa had a very terrible bad history as well. We have seen 
unethical things happening as early as 1997, the, the Trovan trial and other trials in Africa. We have to make sure that while having our participants safe, we have to also promote, and that's the mandate and the responsibility of ethics committee. At the same time, researchers also need to push on that one. Africa has lost millions of, of dollars because we delayed uh, ethical approval. Africa has lost opportunities because we, we did not have clear guidelines. That time has to go. At the same time, we still have that individuals with that mentality that Africa may act, quote unquote, as a testing ground for something. We have to protect that as well. So we have to play the balance between promoting science and ensuring that the right safety and welfare of our study participants is respected. And it's up to all of us here to play that role. Over. Okay, th thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ndebele, would you like to, to weigh in as an ethicist? Yeah, thank you very much. So I am um, one person that is uh, always very, very supportive of uh, uh, collaborative uh, engagements. But I always emphasize that uh, if um, uh, we are going to conduct research uh, in Africa, we want to ensure that that research is responsive to the needs of uh, the host countries. That research is responsive to the communities in which we are going to conduct that uh, research. We also want to ensure that that research is also going to assist in terms of contribution, contributing towards capacity building in that particular country and also in that particular uh, community. So what I'm emphasizing on here is true partnership where we are working together uh, in terms of discussing our needs so that at the end of the day, what we come up with uh, and uh, submit uh, to the funders represents our needs as the community that is hosting, but also the needs of uh, the colleague of ours who is the scientist who is coming uh, to, uh, to work with us. So I believe this has to proceed even up to the point where we are disseminating our findings, even when it comes to issues around publications, to ensure that uh, the African scientists are equally represented in those projects that are conducted in Africa. Those you see for some studies, all the data is coming from Africa. You look at all the authors, all of them are from outside uh, Africa. So these are some of the issues that we want to ensure are clearly addressed when people are considering uh, partnerships. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Mabel, I know you have um, uh, a thought there. Weigh in, please. Yeah, I have a sort of follow-up question, um, which is about Western involvement in medical research in Africa, but on the funding side. Um, so a lot of you guys have alluded to funders um, as a force or as, as stakeholders, a force that is influencing what happens and doesn't happen. And I'm curious to hear more about the different kinds of funders, like, you know, NGOs like the Gates Foundation versus universities. I know you all are involved in, with Western universities versus, you know, governments in Africa versus governments, you know, in the West versus the WHO both what that field is like now and then what a long-term funding picture, better funding picture would look like. Uh, maybe Dr. Moreau, I can go ahead. <laughs> I was hoping my colleagues would and then the funder would go last. Um, my experience is that as you alluded to, there is definitely a political in, um, uh, uh, and a and a power imbalance, so to speak, between international global funders and funding um, research on the African continent. And that most of the times leads to a lot of things um, that I, we probably don't have time to get into uh, at the moment. But what we are doing is that I think as compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago, right now we are actually having those conversations. Uh, we, we are talking about uh, what, we don't think is right. Um, researchers feel comfortable to, to, to say these things. And especially to us on the African continent as the African Academy of Sciences, uh, they are very mo much more comfortable to speak to me and tell me what they don't like about a specific, uh, you know, grant or funder or whatever than they would probably to that person. One of the things that we've done is that we, this is part of the priority areas that I talked about uh, on, on the continent and specifically 
when you when you think about the world that we are living in now, where we are talking about data and access of data and making data open, you know, and this, you know, as funders, we put all these um, um, grant conditions about data and making data open without necessarily looking at the, the distribution of resources between, for example, an African country and here. It's okay for somebody in Boston because they can look at data in two hours, uh, sequence data for that matter in two hours and, and have a uh, hit. In Africa, downloading a, a data, the, the, the same data might take you know, a day or, or longer depending on which country you're in. So we need to be able to be flexible to adjust the different countries and their different needs um, and, and not necessarily st stay with that uh, mind of, you know, I'm funding you and therefore here are the conditions and you must follow these conditions. I think acknowledging that different countries are in different uh, areas of development as we've had uh, all through this conversation and paying attention to that uh, is going to be key going forward. Yeah, thank you. Also to, uh, to add on to uh, what uh, Jane has just said, I think uh, we have seen uh, flexibilities, uh, you know, increasing over the years. Uh, we have seen uh, even the, these big funders actually coming to Africa to find out about uh, the opinions on the African continent with regards to how uh, things uh, should move. So we see uh, concessions being made every now and then with regards to even uh, those uh, restrictions that are placed on those uh, funds. Even if you look at uh, the NIH, there are some uh, flexibilities there. They now allow, uh, you know, indirect costs that they didn't allow uh, in the past. We have seen uh, some new programs that have uh, been initiated uh, in Africa because uh, people in Africa have insisted uh, that these are the areas that uh, they think uh, need uh, some, some focusing. But I need to emphasize that as long as the African governments are not contributing towards uh, the funding for, uh, for medical research, then uh, as long as you are just receiving, right, the giver is the one who is going to give you the conditions. So I want to emphasize that this is the time now uh, for Africa uh, to rise to the occasion and ensure that in all the, the budgets, starting now, all the countries should now provide funding for research. This should not just be about COVID. Because with COVID right now, the, the, the politicians realize we need the capacity to conduct research because they are also dying, right? But let's hope that even post-COVID, those funds will continue uh, to be there so that research is conducted. If you've got your own funds, now you can talk to someone as an equal you know, partner and you might even do some equal contributions uh, when conducting the, the big studies. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ime, do you have any comments on that? Or? I think that, that was very well said. The only one sentence that I may want to add is, be it a funder, an African country, a research institution, or a teaching institution, we all have a goal. And we all need to say that I'm helping the funder to achieve his mission. It's not like I'm receiving money to, you know, we have to make sure that it's not a give and, and take. We have to make it more of a partnership than a donorship. So that's where we should go and uh, we should re really emphasize. Back to you, Zachary. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I think from both the previous uh, comments and the other, the, the last two questions that were posted in the chat, I think have been uh, somewhat partially or exhaustively uh, addressed. And uh, as, as I hand over to, to Mabel, I think something to, to leave each one of us thinking about is uh, I, I noticed that um, Dr. Maroa, Dr. Ndebele, Dr. Ime, uh, you've all done your, your research in, in Africa and some of you are even in, in outside the, in the, rather outside the continent. And uh, we should begin to think about how can we keep brands like yours on the continent to conduct research. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you, Mabel. How about you? All right. Well, I'll give one last chance if any of the panelists have any last thoughts. Um, other, uh, yeah, so any, do any of the panelists have any last thoughts? Yeah, so I can, I can just uh, come in and say 
for me, even as I'm based in the in the in the West, my my heart is still uh, in Africa. So I continue to work with uh, my colleagues uh, in Africa. So every other time, I'm actually looking for partnerships, and I'm also trying my best to ensure that I connect colleagues within my university to colleagues on the African uh, continent. So that's the small part that I can uh, I can play in my current you know uh, position. Yeah, from my part, it's, it's all about appreciation to the organizers, Wandi Sooner, and all the panel, a great, great panel. And, and obviously, I want to end by saying that Africa is rising, and the day that Africa will be there is, is coming, and um, we'll all see that, not, not long from now. So thanks very much. Yeah, and for me, thank you so much um, for giving us this opportunity to discuss this very important uh, uh, question and problem that is something that I think about all the time. So to, to you know, I'm not 100% I'm not best in the US. <laughs> that will make it happy. As you know, I work for the African Academy of Sciences. So every day I'm thinking about issues on the African continent, really. And just like Paul said, trying to connect people here and people in, on, on the African continent as we discuss these things. And thank you so much. And uh, I hope that these conversations continue because uh, the more we talk about them, uh, uh, as Dr. Machari said earlier, advocacy is going to be important. And it has to, co to come from science because, science because scientists don't speak, politicians don't know what we want. So the more we speak, the more they get to hear it. Hopefully one, one time they will actually listen and act. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. And I think for me, one of the gratifying things about this conversation has been the look to the future as well. I think you guys are all, you know, working in the present and grounded in um, what's going on right now and making an improvements now, but are optimistic about the future and are really, you know, putting those two pieces together of the present and the future, um, which I think is very much the spirit of where we should be right now is facing what we're facing with this pandemic, but also look, making sure we don't go back to normal because normal was not as great for everyone as, as it was for some. Yeah. Um, so I'll just leave uh, Zechariah and my email addresses. If anybody has anything they wanna follow up with, um, we will follow up with um, a link to the video once it's up on YouTube. We'll also include if the panelists have anything that they want us to share with you all, um, we're also happy to include that there. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you so much to the panelists.